Thank you. You may be seated. As the Apostle Paul tells us, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you really thank the Lord for the thorns as well as the roses? Do you thank him for the pain as well as the pleasure? Do you thank him for comfort and despair? We need to learn to thank God in everything. And as we look at our text for today, we'll discover that indeed that is the theme of David's psalm of thanksgiving and praise, a psalm that is actually recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 22. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me there to that portion of text, that will be what we will look at today on this Thanksgiving Day service. 2 Samuel chapter 22. I'm not going to read the entire chapter at this point, though I'll be going through it verse at a time, except to note that down at the end of that chapter, verse 50 says, Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. Giving thanks among the heathen. Certainly we find ourselves today in a nation that is filled with heathen. A nation where everyone from leadership all the way down to the lowest person on the street can be counted among the heathen. And yet here is David, he says, Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. He is the tower of salvation for his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed unto David and to his seed forevermore. Verse 50, which we've just read, is really the key to this psalm of David. After reciting all that God has done in the first 49 verses, David says, Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. Therefore means this is the summary of what I have just said, and why I am going to give praise is because of what God has done, as David has recited in those verses. But the context is even larger than that. This psalm in 2 Samuel 22, which is a psalm of David, is set in the context of chapter 21, which immediately precedes it. There we read a litany of all the enemies that David faced. It begins with the Gibeonites, a tribe of lying, deceitful people. David, in chapter 21, has been dealing with Gibeonites. It's the group that takes us all the way back to the days of Joshua, more than 400 years before that time. It takes us back to the days of the invasion of the land, when God led the people out of Egypt and brought them through the wilderness into Canaan. You'll recall that the Gibeonites deceived Joshua and the leaders of Israel because Joshua failed to inquire of the Lord before making a treaty with them. They'd conquered Jericho, they came across, they conquered Ai, and the Gibeonites had seen what God was doing, and so it says they worked wilily, and they sent people pretending to be ambassadors from a far country that had rags tied around their feet and the bread in their bags was moldy. And they came to Joshua into the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure you dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. Joshua said unto them, Who are you, and when do you come from? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God, for we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. They didn't mention the recent conquest. That would have proved that they lived close. Wherefore our elders and the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make you a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you, but now behold, it is dry and it's moldy. 
These bottles of wine which we filled renew, and behold, they be rent. These are garments, and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. They're liars, they're sneaks, they're cheats, they're deceivers. And the men, that is, the men of Israel, took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live, and the princes of the congregation swear unto them. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. The people want to do them away, but the princes say in verse 21, Let them live. Let them be hewers of wood and of water in all the congregations, as the princes had promised them. Why? Because of the oath which we swear unto them. Dear people, it should remind us that those who have gone before us may have generated some problems that we cannot solve. But they are problems that give us a context for thanksgiving. You see, what has happened in the preceding chapter of Samuel tells us that there was a three-year famine that came on Israel in the days of David. God told David that it was because Saul tried to wipe out the Gibeonites. Now you need to realize this is 400 years later. 400 years after that promise to the Gibeonites was made. And Saul said, I don't like these people around. They're not the kind of people that I want to have in my kingdom. I'm going to get rid of them. All of Saul's life goes by. Saul finally ends up getting killed on Mount Gilboa. And he and Jonathan have their bodies hung on the walls of the Philistine towns. And their bodies are rescued by the men of Jabesh Gilead and taken down. And no problems happen for Israel until the days of David for what Saul did to the Gibeonites. We're reminded that when the people of God make promises, God holds even later generations accountable for those promises. We are reminded that it is the height of stupidity to do things without asking God first, as in the days of Joshua. I think too many of us just assume that we can do what we want, but we never ask counsel of the Lord or of those whom the Lord has placed in authority over us. And our failure costs immense grief for generations to come, but we've never given it a second thought. We also learn, though, from this psalm that we will be reading a piece at a time in a moment, that we can learn to give thanks to God even when the presence of those who have caused us immense grief and violated the principles of the word of God, even when they are there. Well, that's the context of this psalm of thanksgiving. David and the people of Israel suffering because of the judgment God sent because Saul killed Gibeonites. David asked the Gibeonites what they wanted, and they told him that they wanted to kill seven of Saul's sons. They didn't want money. They wanted revenge. This is not a nice group of people. David gave them two sons of Rizpah, Saul's concubine. He gave them five sons of Michal, Saul's daughter and David's former wife. He spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, because of a promise that David had made to Jonathan. The Gibeonites killed those seven men. They hung them up. Rizpah guarded the bodies as they rotted away and would not let the birds or animals on them night or day. David heard what she had done. She took, he took the bodies and the bodies of Saul and Jonathan from Jabesh Gilead and buried them. And so then God removed his wrath and delivered Israel from the famine. Interesting national consequences for what had gone on in the past. So the first set of heathen, where David is giving thanks, remember that is the theme verse here, is David is giving thanks among the heathen. The first set of heathen David found himself surrounded by were liars and deceivers. 
They were deliberate, plotting slime balls who really deserved to die, but were able to claim a centuries-old promise of protection. They'd caused starvation problems for David and for his people. Their demands were humiliating and vengeful. Would you give thanks in the midst of a group of people like that? They were a rotten group of people that should have been annihilated in the days of Joshua. But Joshua had given them an oath of protection. These are people who stank in the nostrils of Israel in the days of Joshua. The people murmured against Joshua for having done this. They were a bane on the kingdom of Saul. They caused famine in the days of David. Not a nice group of people. But God delivered David out of their hands and David was able to give thanks. We're reminded that if we violate the principles of the word of God, the solution may be very painful to get back into the cycle of God's blessing. The second enemy from which David was delivered and for which he gives thanks, back there in chapter 21, was Ishbibinob. How many of you, let me see a show of hands, how many of you know who was Ishbibinob? <laughs> Nobody. Ishbibinob is a very big man in scripture, you know that. As a matter of fact, he was one of the four brothers of Goliath who almost killed David in battle. Chapter 21 tells us this, verse 16, And Ishbibinob, which was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. You see, in the psalm of praise, which we have not read all the way through for lack of time, but I'll go through it a piece at a time, in that David says, multiple times, you have delivered me from my enemies. You have delivered me from my enemies. You have delivered me from my enemies. I thank you because you have delivered me from my enemies. And the preceding chapter lists the enemies. In quick succession after Ishbibinob, the other brothers of Goliath are listed as being slain in battle, a total of five giants, including Goliath. The last one had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot for a total of 24 digits. It was impressive to the people. God delivered David from his enemies, and so David was able to give thanks. We know from other passages of the multitude of enemies that David had to face, including enemies in his own house, even his son Absalom, from whom he had to flee into the wilderness. A man who committed gross immorality with the wives David left behind. A man who was a brilliant man, a man who was a talented man, but a man who set himself up against God's anointed. You know the pain David suffered when Absalom was finally killed by Joab and the cohort that surrounded Absalom as he hung in the branches of a tree and they pierced him through with their javelins. But you know the capstone of this psalm of thanksgiving in chapter 22, the thanks for being delivered from the hand of Saul. That's perhaps the most amazing deliverance of all because you see Saul was the king. In our context, it would be like saying Saul was the president of the United States. And David is giving thanks for having been delivered from the president, so to speak, the king of Israel. Saul wanted to kill David. Saul wanted to kill all of David's followers because Saul knew that David had God's blessing. Folks, there are people in authority that would like to wipe out every Christian in this country they see God's blessing, but they're motivated by Satan, and they want to get rid of all of God's people. The problem was, David knew that he could not lift up his hand against Saul because Saul was anointed to be king. God had put Saul on the throne. That's kind of tough if you can't fight back. Kind of tough if you're being pursued by the top authority in your land. Kind of tough if you know that there's nothing you can do against that person except pray and run and hide. 
You know, Saul persecuted and pursued David incessantly. He sent out entire armies to catch one man. But God in his mercy delivered David. And David is giving thanks for that here in Psalm 22. What a dilemma. God had set out the principles that believers must obey those in authority in government. And here was a leader that God said David could not kill even when he had the opportunity to do so on at least two different occasions when Saul came into the cave on one occasion and the other occasion where they crept into the camp and took away items from Saul as he lay there asleep. And yet David would not kill him. David had already at this point been anointed by Samuel and he knew that he was going to be the next king. But that still did not give him the right to kill Saul. All he could do was run and hide and wait for God to remove Saul in God's own timing. Giving thanks among the heathen. David was surrounded by pagans. He was constantly being attacked by heathen. He continually faced plots and attempts against his life. He had family members who wanted him dead. He had an authority figure who was trying to destroy him. But David also had a God who watched his back. And so David was able to give thanksgiving to God in at least 16 ways and for 16 things in this psalm here in 2 Samuel 22. He starts his thanksgiving with the character of God. 2 Samuel 22 beginning in verse 2. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. He begins with the character of God. He continues with the instant accessibility of God in all times of distress. God is always there and God is instantly available. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. In my distress I called upon the Lord, I cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. David had so much to thank God for as he looked back over the years of God delivering him from this enemy and that enemy and from that enemy and from more enemies. And everywhere David turned, God protected him. He continues his psalm of thanksgiving with the omnipotence of God over any possible enemy. God defends his own with intense power, with fierce protection like a mother protects her little cubs. You don't want to get in his way when he's on the war path, just like you wouldn't want to get in the way of a bear or a lion who was coming to protect her little one. Listen to his description of God. Verse 8. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also. He came down. The darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub. He did fly. He was seen upon the wings of the wind, and he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindred. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning, and he discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared, and the foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breast of his nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. But they were not too strong for God. Do you see that description of God coming to protect his own? Do you understand how much he loves his own? Do you see the wrath that he pours out against those who would touch his own? Does David have something to give thanks for? as God reached down and picked him up just as the enemies were clothing, closing in and delivered him and poured his wrath on the enemies. Yes, this is a psalm of thanksgiving. David has much for which to thank the Lord. He continues with the benefits of the blessing of God's loyal love. Verse 19, they prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. There's stability. 
The word prevented is preceded in our modern English. Oh, they were there ahead of me, getting ready for me. But he provided the stability that I need. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Dear people, that is the grace of God. That is the loyal love of God to those who are his children. Do we have much for which to give thanks? Yes. He explains the causes and the effects of the believer who is walking in fellowship with God in the next few verses. Cause and effect. There is cause and effect. If we are not living like God wants us to, we will come under his chastening hand. We will not get the deliverance that we expect. Listen to verses 21 and following. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God, which is what our country has done, as we see in our national proclamations. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness and according to my cleanness in his eyes sight. And then he gives us a, a set of contrasts here. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, that is the stubborn and rebellious, Thou will show thyself unsavory. <laughs> Not very good to the taste. What do you want? Do you want God's mercy? Do you want his blessing? David explains how it comes about. Then he explains at least 11 of the external supernatural resources given by God to help us escape our enemies. And all of them center around the word of God, as you'll see in a moment. The first supernatural resource God gives us is wisdom. Verse 29. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you should do. You're feeling your way along. You don't know what's the right decision to make. God gives wisdom. We prayed it a moment ago. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But God gives light. He gives wisdom. Thou art a lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. He gives ability and agility in times of need. For by thee I have run through a troop. By my God I have leaped over a wall. Where does it come from? From the scripture. Verse 31, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Who is a rock save our God? His word stands forever. He gives us strength and direction. These are the external supernatural resources God has given to you, not just to David. He gives us strength and direction. God is my strength and power. He makes my way perfect. Strength way, direction. He gives us speed. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon high places. Training in skill, verse 35, he teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in mine arms. He gives us protection, verse 36, thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy gentleness hath made me great. He gives us a grip in dangerous places. Thou hast enlarged my step under me so that my feet did not slip. It's like having a much larger foot that grips everything on the rock around it so that you do not slip. He gives me an ability to be on the offense, not merely the defense. Verse 38, I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. He gives us victory. Verse 39, and I have consumed them and wounded them that they should not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. But then perhaps most importantly, humility to give glory to God in verses 40 through 43. For thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose against me, thou hast subdued under me. 
Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They looked, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street, and did spread them abroad. Eleven external supernatural resources given by God to help us escape our enemies, centered around the word of God. Then he tells us who will ultimately listen to him giving thanks to God. You know, we give thanks to God. Who hears? In other words, the enemy may boast now and act like there is no God, but in the end of the matter, they must listen to the child of God, give thanks to the one true God. Verse 44, Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. <laughs> they are the internal strivings of his own nation. Thou hast kept me to be the head of the heathen. They are the outsiders. A people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Strangers shall fade away. They shall be afraid out of their close places. Who's going to hear? All the rebels at home. All the heathen abroad. All the strangers who fought. All the strangers who reject, uh, resisted and rejected. Those are going to be the ones who hear the thanksgiving that David gives to God for his deliverance. And that's the way he closes his praise and thanksgiving to God in verses 47 through 51. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, and that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, and here's our verse, therefore, because you've done all this that I've just described, You've done all these things in those first 49 verses and in the preceding chapter where the enemies were listed. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. He is a tower of salvation for his king and showeth mercy to his anointed unto David. A few moments ago we read President Obama's alleged Thanksgiving Day proclamation. It was painfully evident and even shocking that for the most part he omitted God and thanked men. As one commentator noted, he even tipped his hat to the homosexuals in his statement, and this was from a secular commentator. This tradition of thanksgiving reminds us that no matter who we are or what or who we love, at our core we are first and foremost Americans. We do not have to guess at what God thinks of those who eliminate him and who refuse to give him thanks. They're turned over to the lie of evolution and to the practice of sodomy, Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They can look around and see there is a God. He's a powerful God. He's the creator God. He's a God who, like David described, avenges himself against his enemies. Now listen to this, verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. We have a country in which our leaders are no longer thankful to God, in which our leaders no longer give glory to God. And you know what Paul says next? He says, Wherefore God turned them over to vile affections. He turned them over to their own lusts. And he describes the practices of sodomy. Sodomy is a judgment of God on a nation that has forgotten God. Sodomy is a judgment of God, not something for which the nation will be judged, though that is also true. It is a judgment of God on a nation which has officially rejected God. It does not give him praise, it does not glorify his name, and it is not thankful for what he has done. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, 
what became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. Now let's make some parallels with what we saw with King David. The leader whom we must honor today is much like Saul in the days of David's flight. But God delivered David and God will deliver us. Men are temporal and God removes each and every one in his own time and in his own way. The second application that we can make is that we are surrounded by a culture that is full of lies and deceivers. Smiling people who are slimeball hypocrites like the Gibeonites who claim the blessings of this nation built upon Christian principles but who abuse their freedoms and refuse to give God the glory. The third application I think that we can make is there are giants in the land just like there were giants in the days of David, not just Goliath, but the four brothers of Goliath. There are giants in the land suing to have all vestiges of Christianity removed. I get reports almost daily of legal battles where powerful organizations are attacking Christianity in the public square to remove any public expression of Christ from the marketplace of ideas. The giants of abortion, sodomy, Evolutionary doctrine, secularism, commercial greed, mass media lies, sexual promiscuity, Muslim and other radical terrorism and general rebellion against God surround us and attack us like the brothers of Goliath. There is, as in the days of David, internal family bitterness and hatred and refusal to help and revenge, speaking of the family of the church just like there was bitterness, hatred, refusal to help, and revenge in the family of David. There are leaders in every branch of government and at every level of government that consistently seek for the demise of the church and the testimony of Christ. You may have heard there's been a recent attack and a federal judge has said, okay, the clergy housing allowance is no longer going to be permitted because uh, secular organizations don't have it. But you know, God is still on the throne. Like David, we can do three things. Number one, we can call on the Lord and he hears us instantly. From his temple in heaven, he hears us instantly. And he comes forth. Oh, remember that powerful passage we've just read about describing how God comes down out of the heavens with his wrath and with the thunder and with the lightning and with the fire and coals burn before him amazing picture of our God coming to defend his own. Number two, we can expect God to defend us in his righteous, omnipotent power with his wrath against our enemies. Number three, we can receive from him what he has promised, wisdom, ability, agility, strength, direction, speed, training, skill, protection, grip in dangerous places, ability to be on the offense, not merely on the defense, victory and humility to give the glory to God and not to try to claim it for ourselves. And someday as David prophesies here in this psalm, someday we will see the heathen who surround us and who boasted themselves against God stand and listen to us as we give God the glory, as we give God the praise, and as we give God the thanksgiving that is due to his holy name. Thanksgiving is centered around the God of the universe. Proper thanksgiving is to be directed to the Lord not to other people. All that has come from his gracious and benevolent hand is something for which we give him thanks. He is the creator, the sustainer, the protector, the provider. He is the one who is good and generous and patient and kind. He's the one who knows our needs before we ask. He answers our prayers before we pray. He sovereignly ordains all that comes to pass before it happens. The Bible says, indeed it is true, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thanks thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Colossians tells us the same thing. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto the God and the Father by him. When we put God back on the throne of our heart, his peace rules our lives. And it produces a thankful spirit. It changes our lives so that whatever you say or do will be in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you know, looking at the last phrase of that text in Colossians, there in verse 17, you cannot give thanks to the Father without Jesus. And because of Jesus, your heart, if it's truly regenerated, must give thanks because of Jesus. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we give you thanks.